This episode of The Honeydew is brought to you by Raycon, Upstart, and Manscaped. More on that later. Let's get into the do. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to The Honeydew, y'all. We are over here doing it in the Night Pants Studios. I am Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough for your support. Uh, please make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channels. You get the audio on Monday. You get the video on Tuesday. We got the time codes in there. You can jump around the stories if you want. Uh, and I want to make sure you guys are aware, if you're not, of my Patreon show, The Honeydew With Y'all, where I'm highlighting the lowlights with y'all. Um, if you or someone you know has a story that has to be heard, please submit at honeydewpodcast at gmail.com. It's only five bucks a month. You're getting four to five episodes a month, depending on how many weeks there are in that given month. And um, it's 60 bucks. And I've said before, I know that's a lot of money right now. I know people are on, on unemployment. I know things are uncertain. I know that how hard you work for your money. So thank you for those of you who have supported. Um, and also, just to let you know, there is a yearly subscription option. If you sign up for a year, you'll save over a month. It's like five episodes or something like that. A little over a month of free content if you sign up for the year and commit that way. Um, please go subscribe to all the social media, the Facebook fan page, the Twitter account, all that stuff. The website for the show is thehoneydewpodcast.com. Uh, we got some new merch coming. Uh, there's going to be some new night pants are coming for the fall. We got uh, the mugs out there, the hoodies. I'm telling you, they are fleece hoodies. And the king of fleece will tell you how good they are. It's the best hoodie I ever had. We got night pants, night shorts. I uh, got some new Ryan Sickler stuff coming too. Um, so um, thank you all for supporting, for wearing it. I appreciate you making Night Pants Nation. One of the best things going out there in podcasting today. Um, if you live in L.A. and you need musical instruments or lessons for you or your kids, this is the spot. Santa Monica Music Center. They have online classes from L.A. musicians. You don't have to live here for that. You go to santamonicamusic.com. You use the code HONEYDEW. They'll waive the registration fee and give you one free lesson when you sign up for a package. All right. Now that that is out of the way. Very excited to have today's guest back on the Honeydew, y'all. The saga continues from New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joey Diaz. What's happening, Ryan Sickler? It's great to see you. Uh, I know we've been great talking, but this you. is the first time I've seen your face. And uh, I'm, I'm actually excited that, that you're in Jersey where most of this originates and we're going to continue this story. You good? I'm good. All right, so what do you want to plug? I'm feeling let's, good. Let's let everybody know you got the new podcast coming. Tell tell everybody everything, please. I got the new podcast that I'm, I started last week, real low budget, because I can't get all the pieces. Everything's running behind. So if I wait for everything I'm waiting on, I got because I got a bar set up, I can't start till like fucking November. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with an, with, a, with, with an iPhone, a mic, and uh, Apple and YouTube. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Just the basics to start off with. You're looking at the set. I got Bruce Lee, the game of death behind me. I got Def Leppard high and dry, Led Zeppelin two, and ACDC, the bonfire to the left of me. I'm ready. And over on that side of the office is the side for the album of the week for Patreon. Yeah. So I've turned my whole fucking house into this fucking camera place. So the electrician was supposed to come today between 12 and 1. He calls at 12. He can't make it till 1. Then he calls at 1.10 and says 30 minutes. I said, listen, let's just do it Monday at 8 when my daughter's in school. And so it's just a fucking waiting game. But I'm ready to fucking go. I know. Dude. So I'm we're, locked we're, up. We're just soundproofing now. It's uh, Amazon's backed up. Everything's back. You can't get the shit in. Every, I know, dude. Or you nothing, miss, nothing. so you it's go. A You're doing the right thing. So I'm going to just get a fucking iPhone. Best camera in the country, in the world, is on the iPhone. It catches <laughs> x-rays and shit. X-ray. You take a picture of a skinny... Yeah, you take a picture of a skinny person, you see a shoulder bone and shit with the fucking iPhone. It's sensational. It's sensational. So why am I fucking around? 
You put the iPhone, you, you get a mic from Amazon, and you fucking go through the box, and that's it. You get a second mic, and I got a little setup. All this is is communication and letting people know what the fuck is going on. That's it. Why am I making such a big deal about it? The bar, I got to get lights. I got to get a plug. I got to get a panel. What a fucking nightmare. I got to get booze. This is nice and easy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I know. And then these people complain <laughs> about these free shows. They have no idea what you got to do to set this shit up to do the damn thing. <laughs> no, no. They don't know. So you they know what? Know. I, 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 I looked at a bunch of people's podcasts. There's people that just put a picture on YouTube of them smiling. Yeah. And they put a podcast up. Yeah. And they get a hundred. What's the difference? I'll do the same fucking thing. Yeah. Some weeks, if I'm in the mood, I'll let you see me. If I get up at four and I have too much in me, then forget about it. I got fucked up last Monday by mistake. What do you mean I got by those mistake? Hashtag, uh, you know me. I got a weird tolerance. There's a company out there that has these hashtags, and all this shit is suspect. I ain't, I ain't bad mouthing them. They're great. They just put Houdini stuff in their shit. You know, I've been around drugs. I know what drugs should feel like. When you take one of these edibles, you feel a little bit different. So I, I got some sent out to me in the hash tabs. And I opened the party with like four of them. You know me. I ain't fucking around. Oh, my God. Was <laughs> You just kicked it off with four? <laughs> oh, my God. With four. Now I, now I know what Tom Segura felt like on that plane ride. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah. I was falling asleep. It was oh, terrible. Yeah. We had we had to go out to dinner with the kids, and like uh, uh, one of his classmates, and one of the, I was falling asleep at the table. It was a nightmare. My wife had to say something to me, tremendous. But every <laughs> once in a while, you gotta have an accident. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's it's quarantine. Uh, it is, man. This shit is nuts. It's it. Homeschools when it officially really put me is. over the edge. I was doing all right, and then the homeschool hit, and I am not doing okay, man. I am not okay. No, sure. nobody is. Nobody no, is. Crazy. I had so she 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 homeschooled today. She got out. I got a pizza for lunch, and then I took her for a bike ride for like forty five minutes. You know, because we got the the neighborhood. It's like a fucking one big fucking driveway. It's tremendous. That's what I want to so ask. So we are, just are went you for loving it. Are you loving being back in Jersey? Are you? Are you? How do you feel? You feel yes. good. I'm home. I'm home. I'm not living where I grew up, which makes it even better. Yeah. I go up there. I say hello. Like I went up there Tuesday. I went to my mother's grave. You know, I got pissed off because the Puerto Rican didn't fucking mow the lawn. I gave him a yardstick and I told him to take extra care of this fucking dead stiff. And the fucking, there's a big chunk of grass. I thought it was like a snake pit. So thank <laughs> God I brought gloves with me. I fucking ripped some of the fucking leaves off, but I got to bring a fucking blow. And I went to get flowers for a grave and they decided to go on vacation on September 30th. Like, can you believe that? The day I got there was that what they what they went on vacation from 930 to 10 something, 10 four or something like that. And I'm like, I know they're Spanish. That's a Jew holiday. <laughs> like, why are they taking off for a Jew holiday? They're Spanish people. <laughs> I was pissed off Tuesday. Tuesday was a good. But then I saw then I went by my buddy's funeral parlor. You know, I got a kid I grew up with that his family has a funeral parlor. They've had it in the family for like 100 years. So I went by there. I sat in the fucking office, talked to him for a little while. It was great. It was great. And that that part of it has been great. Yeah. The part that I'm not dealing with is my schedule. My schedule is fucked up. So I get anxiety from this not having a schedule. So every day my schedule gets a little better. Like I'm starting to go to bed now at 1130. It was three, four in the morning for Dude, a month. I, I'm right there with you, man. Yeah. I, I'm a very uh, structured, scheduled person, and I, I'm used to this and this and this and this. This homeschool fucking sit there and help them all day. It, it. I, I feel like I'm drowning. I really do. I, 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 all good things are happening, but it's all coming all over the fucking place. And this homeschool just killing me, bro. Killing me. You know, I got people calling me for this, that. I, I can't even fucking function. I'm not even functioning 100%. I got to be honest with you. I'm I get a lot either. of anxiety. Yeah. I get a lot of social anxiety. 
I'm going to start to do a, a comedy residency for the month of October at Uncle Vinny's. Oh, By great. the time this comes out, I'll do the first. You know, they see 36 people. They socially distance. And at least I get to fucking get an outlet once a week. You know, it's just 36 tickets. That's it. <sighs> once a it's week. It's indoor. Hear that. Once a it's week. Indoor. Yeah. It's, it's indoors. It's indoors. Once than, yeah. a week. Yeah. And that's that's all I got right now. That's all I got right now. I, I got a family. I got the, the winter's gonna be fucking cold here. Yeah. You know, where I live, it don't take a genius. If you look on my block and look around, you're like, boy, there's fucking deer out in September. Yeah. You know, there yeah. were deer out when I moved in on August thirty first. This is a cold fast fucking yeah. the way the trees are shaped and shit, you know when the wind comes in, it's gonna be fucking cold. So I'm just bucking down. I'm not going anywhere. There's no plans on any planes or anything. No. And I'm just gonna provi- I'm just gonna provide content. That's it. That's all you can I'm do. I'm gonna and do my that's, Patreon. That's the right thing to do. Uh, that's the right thing to do, and do my podcast, and then get on stage once a week, and that's the best I could do right now. You know, I don't want to go out there and charge somebody twenty five bucks and not have a polished hour. I I not, wholeheartedly I'm not even close agree to that. that. I'm doing my first I, show I in didn't... seven months on Friday uh, next week. Uh, it's a rooftop that Sarah Where Mello. At? It's a outside rooftop Sarah Mello puts on, and she's had like Neil Brennan and Santino, and and I and I hit her up, and she's like, "I'd love to have you." So it's my first one in seven months, and it looks like they're doing a good job uh, with that one, separating everybody. It's an open air venue, um, so we'll see. I just, you know, I agree. I can't go ask you for money if I don't have. At least a polished 30 and an 80 percent other 30 I'm working on. You know what I mean? I don't feel right taking, especially yeah, now I people are on unemployment. You know, people are freaking out. I hell, I even I'd let, I love. I, it's why I love what you do with your Patreon. If people don't know, it's a dollar. Is it still that? Is that correct? It's a do, It's a dollar until right. the fourth, the, the twelfth. The twelfth, I got to go up to three, five, ten, fifteen. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the shirt designs to come in to give them an option on shirts. And stuff like that. Uh, the Patreon has really taken a lot of the anxiety away. Mm-hmm. When I answer those messages, I laugh my ass off. You know, they could go either way. Yeah. Every day I get one guy to tell me that he's in the mood to bust somebody's head. I got guys that are ready to smack somebody for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're all over the place. Are you getting back to So them? it's just been. Yes. I. That's my main thing on Patreon is yeah. the messaging. I believe that connection is the most important, you know. So it's an I, I sit there for two hours a day. When you have thirteen thousand people, that's a lot of messages. Yeah, it is. So it's two hours a fucking day. So I wanted to slow it down a little bit, go up to three dollars, and uh, just give them tears, give them options. Give me more options to work with, you know. Well, I'll say this, too, because I just did this for myself. But Patreon now, if anybody out there doesn't know, you can do this for Joey, too. They offer a yearly subscription. Uh, so instead of doing right. monthly and worrying about your card getting declined or any of that, you can sign up for a year. So I encourage you right now, go sign up for Joey's Patreon. Get the yearly package. Sign up for mine, the Honey Do With You All. Get the yearly package. Um, and you'll save some money on it. you end up getting free episodes and free content. So. Um, but again, I know money's tight for people, so I'm right there with yeah, you. Yeah, no, I understand. Mm-hmm. That's why I did what I did, and I give you options, and uh, you know, just to have that connection. You know, the other, the I think a lot of social media you look at, just when you read a couple of things, it just pulls you down. You're like, really, I'm back on Facebook reading this shit. Right. I'm back on Twitter, even though I love Twitter. I love torturing people on Twitter. <laughs> I've cut down a lot. I've cut down my usage a lot since I've been here. So here's well, the problem. You're setting, I got. Up, you're setting up the fucking, you got real shit to do, you know? Yeah, no, no. Here's the problem I got. I don't know if the story I'm telling you, if I was, did I, did I come out on bail or am I in prison already? I'll, I'll tell you exactly where we are because I listened. So it was September 88. You were in prison and you just got in there and you said, who do I walk into and see? And it's a guy with the two broken legs that had just jumped out the window that you'd heard about before and he's playing cards. That's where we are. And you're, I gotta keep, you're in and, there. And, 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 and the funny thing about that situation was 
but I got accused of that one. Right. When they were questioning me, they asked me if I knew that guy. So when I saw him at the prison diagnostic, it made me laugh my fucking ass off. It was crazy. <laughs> that that time period going up to that was crazy because I got sent to Summit County first. They told me I wouldn't get the diagnostic. So they sent me to Summit County. Did I tell you that? Yeah, and let me just let me, me just right say this. Bold- let me say this real quick for everybody. If so we're picking up, I guest hosted uh, Joey's church. So the story of the kidnapping and everything is on a few weeks ago before Joey left, a couple months ago now probably, geez, um, that uh, that story is there. So you jump from the honeydew, you can go to the church, get that full episode. It's a two-hour episode. It's fantastic about the whole kidnapping. And now we're picking up with Joey in jail. So please, sorry, continue. Okay, so I I, I went from, I got sentenced in Boulder, and once you go, you know, you go into the cell, you start talking to other fucking knuckleheads, and they told you, they told me the system was backed up, that the system was backed up 30 to 90 days, which is good because you get county jail time. You get two days for one. Mm -hmm. So you want that county jail time, you know. So they they told me that they were sending inmates to Oklahoma and Missouri to, for the overpopulation in Colorado. So be prepared. And they told me all this shit. And I just yesed them to death, you know, whatever. And the next morning I get waking up and I'm get taken to Summit County Jail. That's a ski resort up there, like uh, an hour or two away from Boulder. And I went up there and it was fucking August and it was just gorgeous out. And I made friends with a kid from Brooklyn. And all he did every day was play handball. My son tan, I was brown because I would play with my shirt off with him all day long. We play handball and he was locked up because he fucking had the feds. He told the feds he would cooperate and buy two kilos of Coke. Did I tell you this? I don't think so. And he went, he set, he set the whole house up. He pulled up. In the Fed car, the Feds waited for him outside. He went in through the front and went out through the back and took the Feds 30 grand and oh. him and his buddy left. <laughs> and they caught him two years later in Brooklyn. Years. And they brought him back to Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. This kid was. So I became friends with this guy. This guy was my type of guy. He tricked the fucking Feds. And they had the place around it. And he still, he did something the day before where he went under the fence and through a basement and they came out into the car. So they just pulled out like residents and he was in the back seat. It was perfect. So I became friends with him and I became friends with this, not friends. I became friendly with this guy. You know, those guys that always show you naked pictures of their girlfriend. You ever have those idiots? Yeah. A lot of comics. There's always one fucking moron. <laughs> yeah. They'll go, hey, come here for a second. Look at this chick I'm banging. And they'll show you like a naked picture the chick sent them at lunchtime or something. Well, this guy was one of those guys. He, there was no cell phones then, actually. He just had Polaroids or regular pictures. And all day long, she would send her pictures of her in a bikini. Just focus on that story for now, because we're going to come back to that. I became friends with this idiot and another idiot. There were two idiots. I would just say hello to him, but he would always go, hey, look at my girlfriend. How hot is she? Now, this guy was a fucking mutt. And I go, what's your situation? He goes, my girlfriend is living with my roommate now, and she's got my full support, and I'm locked up for three years, blah, blah, blah. So, boom. I wake up one day and now I'm a diagnostic. They call me in the morning and they go, pack your shit. You're going to diagnostic. Diagnostic is where you go for two weeks and they go into your head. It's a fucking jungle. What do they do? It's real. They they give you a physical. They they fucking test you. They do testing scores. Like psyche valves and shit like that? Yeah. You know, they, they tell you to identify circles. What comes to your mind when you see a horse, you know, you fuck with their heads. It's like Charles Bronson and the, and the dirty dozen. 
Did you ever see when Charles Bronson's a dirty dozen? They tried to fuck with him. That was me. And yeah. So God knows what's on file. You know what I'm saying? Right now, the feds must think I'm retarded, you know, because I <laughs> fucked with them throughout that whole thing. You know, what comes to your mind? The Cuban embassy. I would just say fuck them yeah. things. So. so it's like five days of testing. They draw blood and all that shit. And the big thing was HIV. You know, they were looking for HIV. And then you wait there till you get an assignment. And I wanted to go to Rifle. There's a There was a low... Uh, low risk prison and rifle. There was two low risk prisons. There was rifle and there was Golden, Colorado, the home of Coors. Coors, yeah. So it was only an hour from Boulder. I didn't want to go to Golden. I wanted to go to Rifle because they let you ski in the winter when you were at this prison. They let you work at the ski resort in the winter and at the pool and the movie theater in the summer. No, the ski resort and the movie theater in the winter, and in the summer they would let you work at a local pool. And what what do they have you doing? Like janitorial, like if, selling pretzels, oh. sweeping the pool, lifeguards. They were all prison inmates that had worked themselves into good points, and now they would be allowed out to go to do work. So that's the like the little bad work release, and then you come back and spend the night there. Is that how? Yeah, okay, got it. Just yeah, it was pretty much. It gets a little easier for you. The only thing Golden did was clean highways, so I didn't want to go to Golden because that's all you do every day. You go out somewhere, they put a fucking cone around you, and those are those idiots you see with the little orange yeah, fucking yeah. vest on <laughs> as you do as you're doing ninety. On the 405. I don't need that shit to get hit by a car. So I ended up working in the kitchen. They gave me a job. And I, I got a call one morning. And they said, you're going to fucking Golden. I was pissed. Even though it was an hour from where I lived. It would make it so easy. Not even an hour. It was maybe 30 minutes from where I lived. You know, so... My girlfriend could come visit me. My friends could come visit me. Family could come visit me. You know, shit like that. So I got the wake-up call to go to Golden. And it, was, and it was called Camp George West. If you go online, you can look it up. It's still online today. Camp George West. It says an institution, whatever. Fuck that. It's a fucking prison. Don't let them. They redid Army Barracks. Okay. It was an old Army Barracks. So uh, I didn't know what to expect, guys. You know, I was supposed to go to prison. I was expecting to be like on a chain gang or something like that. And here I am in Golden, Colorado at the fucking old army barracks. You know, and they you walk in, you register at the table. They treated you like shit. You know, they'd say something to you. And you were supposed to go to your room and then put your stuff away. And then right from your room, you got to go meet with your counselor. So let me ask you a question here. You have a room. Do you have, are they electronic doors that shut and lock? Or are they treating you like an adult here? And how many people in a room? So they put me in a, <clears throat> like a door, uh, a barrack right in front of the office first. And there was eight single rooms to that barrack. And then a shower and bathroom area. Maybe three stalls to shit, three stalls to piss, and like three showers with curtains. And you had eight guys in there, you know, in each one. You could visit each other's rooms. Some people had curtains up. Some people had beads up like they were hippies. Black guys just had a sheet up. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't give a fuck. You know, you, you got to knock on the sheet. What the fuck? Knock you know what I'm saying? The... Like, <laughs> you, know, you fucking nuts or what? Dog, you didn't knock on my sheet. What the fuck? I got to knock on your sheet. <laughs> so it's fucking crazy. So, uh, that they put me in this one dorm the first day and 
I don't know. Right away, two guys from New York came up to me. How you doing? They were two creepy guys. But I had to go to see, I had to go see my counselor. So they were talking to me and I'm like, listen, guys, it's all great that you're from Brooklyn or wherever the fuck you're from. But I got to go see my counselor. I'll see you when I get back. And I went to see my counselor and he was supposed to be like, uh, they said, wait outside his door. And he'll let you know when to come in. I don't know what the fuck is going on. So I'm just standing outside his door. And he finally opens the door and he comes out and he goes, who are you? And I go, I'm uh, Joey Diaz, Jose Diaz. I'm here to, you're my counselor. And he goes, good. I was, I've been waiting for you. We walk in his office. He sits down and he goes, let me tell you how this starts. I don't like fixing niggas. Whoa. So right off the bat. He's like, I don't like fixed niggas, and I'm not too crazy about Jews. And you fall into one of those categories, so you're not one of my favorites. <laughs> you come and see me once a week. Yeah. He's like, you come see me once a week. You tell me what's going on, and we'll be cool. The first time you get a write-up or a drug test, I send you back to Ordway. Any questions? Get out. And I said, I was walking out. He goes, have you ever had, what's that shit that if you cough, not gangrene, tuberculosis, tuberculosis something. Yeah, TB. He asked me something. He goes, you ever have TB? I go, do I look like I have TB? He goes, good. Go see the kitchen. They needed somebody in the, in the kitchen to work. <laughs> Go see Mr. Y if you've ever had TB. Now, usually people prep you. They'll tell you like, oh, by the way, if they ask you if you have TB, say no, because if not, they'll make you work in the kitchen. Nobody told me about that one. Oh. So I was like, no, I never had TB. So they go, go see the kitchen guy. He's looking for help. So the kitchen guy was a black dude, maybe six foot six, 310 pounds, retired fucking Marine, whatever he was. He was retired from the service. This guy did not mess around. His name is Mr. Yardborough. Big brother, big burly brother. Looked like the coach of Georgetown. <laughs> Remember the old coach of Georgetown? He looked just like that. Yeah, just yeah. like that dude. I I love that. I love that motherfucker. He used to uh, coach Patrick Ewing. Yeah, what I the love fuck? that. I can't even believe I can't remember John uh, John, Tom, John Thompson. What the fuck's his name? Yes, Mr. John Yarborough. Thompson. So he, Mr. Yarborough, says to me, "I go in there and I had my file, my paperwork in my hand that the counselor gave me." He goes, "Give this to the kitchen guy." So I gave it to him, and he looks at it. He goes, "Jose Diaz." He goes, "You go." He goes. You look like a baker because you look <laughs> Italian. What nationality are you? I go, I'm Cuban, sir. He goes, Cabano. That's good. You people put good seasonings in the food. He goes, I want you to be my baker. He goes, have you ever baked before? I go, never. He goes, well, there's instructions there. Your first job is cinnamon muffins. <laughs> I can't believe that you're in prison on kidnapping charges and you're about to bake cinnamon muffins. <laughs> so, Joe, you are one of a kind, man. There ain't nobody like you. There was, <laughs> so there's, a, there's another kid. Oh, there's another kid who, who got there with me who he also made a baker. And this kid... And me became tight. He was a white kid. He came from a good family. And he went out and got drunk one night and killed two old people. Oof. This kid this kid was like, who can I compare him to? Like, just think of somebody that like never. Yes. And just made he was like Steve Simone. Yeah, made a mistake. Made one mistake. He was a college kid. I'll never forget him because he was so scared and I had to like hold him and tell him, you're going to be fine. Nobody's going to mess with you. We're in the kitchen now, you know? And, uh, we both got sentenced like the same, like, you know, around the same time we both ended up in the kitchen and he knew a little more than me. 
about bacon. That's all I know. And I was a little older than he was. He was a real college kid. And we were making the cinnamon. We had to get to the next morning at like four. And we're like reading that stuff and we're mixing. You know, they have all this industrial type shit. So I don't know how to make fucking muffins, whatever. They said four to two inch thing. And you put it with a swirl. So I'm like, those things look fucking like little midget muffins. I'm not giving out those. If I'm going to bake, I'm going to bake right, the cinnamon muffins. So I made these big fucking flying saucer things, and I started putting them in the oven. <laughs> He's over here with the Cinnabon <laughs> fucking muffins. Oh, yeah. I'm over there trying to be Cinnabon. <laughs> I'm, and, every, and, and whatever it called for, I added extra. Like whatever flour, put an extra pinch in there. Sugar, put an extra sugar in there. <laughs> I like uh, fucking baking soda. I just put extra everything. And next thing you know, the fucking me and the guy at bullshit were waiting for the first batch to come out. And one of the one of the cooks was a black guy. His name was Chicken Hawk. His <laughs> real name was <laughs> I love the nicknames. Uh, His real name was Spencer Antoine. I loved him. I loved him since day one. He was a black dude that had a James Brown haircut, but his eye used to wander, mm -hmm. and he really was crazy. He took a liking to me. He's like, what the fuck is burning? And I go, I don't smell nothing burning. He goes, what the fuck is wrong with you, boy? Something's on fire over there. And sure enough, <laughs> the oven was. <laughs> you like <laughs> Setting the fire in the prison kitchen, dude. You're too much. I'm gonna tell you something. If there's something black people hate, it's fucking fire. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say burnt food. <laughs> no, let me tell you something. Black people hate fire. <sighs> just from a natural, they just lose their mind when there's a fire. Black people. It's in their DNA. <sighs> I love, I love them to death. The African Americans. So you light a fire on an African American, they'll run fucking quicker than the oh, KKKs for chasing. <laughs> these brothers, these Ash brothers just said, yup. <laughs> <laughs> brothers oh, don't like shit. fire. They were, they were, they were, they were pissed off. So the oven's on fire. <laughs> All the kitchen workers, there was no Mexicans in jail at that time that were in the kitchen. It was it was us it was it was us two white guys and everybody else is African American oh, in this kitchen. And they run oh, out. God. They don't like fire. They run the fuck out. So white boy, the college kid actually picked up one of those fucking fire things, you know, with the, the uh, yeah. with the dust. Mm -hmm. And he's over there like fucking hitting them with dust, and finally the fire went down. The muffins were burnt. Half the oven was burnt. Mr. Yarbrough came in. Oh, shit. He's like, Mr. Jose, Mr. Jose Diaz, obviously I made a mistake. I thought you Italians were experienced. I go, I told you I wasn't Italian. I'm a, I told you I was Cuban. He goes, I thought you were messing with me. I wasn't messing with you. I don't know how to bake, all right? So don't make me a fucking baker. So he fired me and the white boy. He goes, you guys are fired. So he goes, all right. I, I, I like, I hey, he back. fired you. <laughs> That's the only kind of fire he's all right with. <laughs> right. I, like, I, he fired you me. You got right? fired for fucking setting the black, kitchen black, on fire. Black, black people hate <laughs> fires, right? So. <laughs> it, it, <It's> ridiculous. <laughs> it, it made him. Oh, it made shit. him skittish, you know? It made him, like, kind of trusting and not trusting. But then he realized that we were the good kids, me and this other guy. So he goes, I got a position that opened up that you guys would be perfect for. Did when you used to have a driver's license? And the other guy, you know, he murdered two people. He got no license. They, he's not even allowed to go on a scooter and fucking... I had a license. Believe it or not, I had a license. So he goes, okay, I got a job for you guys. He goes, you're gonna, I'm gonna be the stock clerk. 
So I'm in charge of ordering food, making sure that everything is, is stocked well, vegetables, milk, rice, meat, potatoes. The other guy was in charge of the lunch for the fucking guys that go out yeah. and uh, pick up pick up trash on the road. So he was in charge of making their sandwiches and finishing and doing the bags. I would help him some mornings. And I also got in charge of driving the sandwiches to the guys. Oh, so you'd be like the you'd be like their Uber deliver. Nah, you <laughs> delivered the food to the highway workers. <laughs> oh my god! You know what's so funny? All these years I've seen those guys on the highway, and never once have I thought, "What do they do for lunch, or how do they get lunch?" And that's what happens. You drove them lunch. You, you're the del- oh, they probably love seeing your ass. A fucking dirty. It was a dirty lunch. It was like a salami and god. cheese sandwich. An apple, a thing of milk, maybe a bag of chips, you know. But you got to also remember, here's a lesson for people at home. Those guys that are cleaning the roads, they're also picking up drugs. Because Why? they people find throwing out them the out night- the window and shit? No, they find out the night before what, what the, where they're going. And they'll call out and go, Ryan Sick, do me a favor tomorrow. I'm going to be working on the corner of Colfax and Riverside. Hide something somewhere and let me know where you hide it in the morning. I'll call you in an hour. And you would say, there's a little bush I put in a bag next to a beer can. Pick up the bag and throw it in the garbage and make believe, but there's an ounce of Coke in there or an eight ball of Coke. That's how drugs go into the prison. A lot of drugs go in through... Uh, you know, guards, but a little, 50% of the drugs go in through those street crews. You pay off the guards. That much? So they don't search you. That much? 50%. Yeah. yeah. There's a bag of Coke at mile marker six. I love I love the criminal mind. That's why whenever you're making a U-turn and you see something weird, stop the car and pick it up. You don't know what it could be. It could end up like... Yeah, like Tony Blundetto in The Sopranos when he found that bag full of money with crack. Yeah, yeah. He found like three hundred thousand. What the same fucking thing? That was for somebody else. So I did, and it it was it. You know, I think about that time, my time in that place. I was in that place from September to February. All right, let me six months. Let me ask you this because I want to know this. You you you're obviously in there with people who've killed people. You've said, Um, who's Who's the baddest motherfucker you saw in that prison? Who was the guy that you just did not fuck with? Was there one of those guys? And did, and also, did you, ever, guy, did you ever get was, tested? Those are things I want to know. There was a guy. The two things that happened to me there were great. Because when I first got in there, I was pretty much independent. But I had the kitchen crew behind me. And they were all african American. The leader of that crew, his name was Chicken Hawk, okay. Antoine Spencer. He was in there for uh, involuntary murder, like involuntary homicide, where you pull out a knife and I pull out a knife and you go to stab me first and I stab you. And so it was like a, a questiony type murder. Yeah. He stabbed the guy three times or whatever. He was a tough guy. Like his rap sheet. He had done 16 years. He was going home now, you know. The bikers had a halfway tough guy that at the time, I forget what his name is, but I'll remember it by the end of this podcast. Real wrinkly face, you know, pug nose guy. He had a reputation as a hard hitter. There was a couple bikers that ran in that. They weren't the, the white guys that hate. There was a couple of those guys. But the baddest guy in that system when I was in there was a white guy by the name of John Clark. He really had a couple of murders. He was just ending a big stretch. If I was 26, he had to be about 42. And he had spent like the last 20 in jail. 
Vice and a bunch of guys and shit like that on the street. He had come from Philly. Um, and he befriended me. We became friends. So I had coverage from him. I had coverage with the brothers. And that's all the coverage I needed. It, you know, yeah. <clears throat> there was there was a couple there was a couple Mexicans I was friends with that they ran by themselves. Uh, but that was that was the strength. My friend was a my best friend in prison. Was a crip. Okay. Was a big time crip. We became really good friends, and my other good friend in prison was a blood. So we became really good friends. So we, because I was in the middle of it, those two guys spoke. The one, and they were both interesting guys. The one guy's sister was just running in the Olympics, the 88 Olympics. No shit. She was the really popular, yeah, she was the really popular black woman, African-American woman. Is that Jackie Joyner? That Carson? ran was in that, the Olympics. Was that her? One of those. There was right two of yet? those sisters. Yes. Yeah. One of those was wow. a brother. Okay. And the and the crip, his name was Tore. And he was my fucking brother in there. Like me and him were together 24 7. We worked in the kitchen together. We ate together. You know, he had seven girlfriends. And he would schedule the visitations, all of them, from Monday and Tuesday. You think I'm fucking kidding? They, they were to come. He too, was huh? making. He was the head of moving cocaine from L.A. to Colorado. That was his primary job for the Crips. He was loaded with money, loaded. He had seven women, and each of them, all of them, were driving hot cars and all those cars were his he had kids with all of them he was my age he was a millionaire and he would he would make all his women bring him nutter butters <laughs> so at night him and i, I, I would eat nutter, nutter butters butter. like a motherfucker <laughs> oh, he loved dude. nutter butters that, that brother loved nutter butters and he was beautiful. He looked like Michael B. Jackson, the guy that played on Rocky. <laughs> Michael that's B. Jordan. Looked, that's who he looked like. Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan, whatever. <laughs> I love him. He looked just like Michael B. Jordan. Just all ripped up and gorgeous. And we became, oh, and we used to laugh. I used to make him laugh. He, you know, he was just at night. We'd watch TV. He, he got a TV in his room. We all had little black and white TVs. But his room, he had like speakers. He rigged up and stuff. So I had my strength came from running the stock because I had my own independent stock shed about a half a mile away from the institution. So I could hide stuff for prisoners. So when the dogs would come, they would never bring them out to that shed. So once a month, dogs came through the sheds and they would find syringes and stuff. But if you hid your stuff by me, you wouldn't, the dogs wouldn't come out there. So what I started doing was I wouldn't hide nothing in the shed with the food and the freezer. I would hide stuff outside the property where the cameras wouldn't see. So I would hide like heroin syringes, heroin, steroids, cash. If you wanted to hide your cash, because you weren't supposed to have over $20 on you. So I had cash in there also I used to hide because I hooked up with a little chubby Italian guy. He was a gangster from one of the families. He was on the tail end out too. And what he did was he ran a pool thing. So he did it for college football, pro football, and Monday night football. You know those pools that you run? Dude, I, like yes, 50 I cents wins you like, like 20 bucks. Yeah. So I became, it was just such a great, I became partners with him. I said to him, he, cause he used to cook every night. He was the jailhouse cook. He made nachos every night. And he made hot dogs. He made hot dogs with the buns already around them. What do you call those? Those little pork, 
pork in the br- pigs in blanket. blanket. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. He would, he would, he would take, he would take an iron that you iron shirts and you take the guts out of it and you put it in a, a fucking bowl with a piece of cheese and that's how you melt the cheese. You stir it. So he would start making green chilies like in the morning Damn. at six with cheese, and by eight o'clock there'd be twenty motherfuckers standing outside his army barracks waiting to buy nachos to watch TV. <laughs> so it's a big night. It, it was hilarious. Yeah, I mean, you're fun. making you prison sound shit. all right. Yeah, for real. So I told him, I said, I said, listen, you're only gambling, and you're only getting through to a couple white guys. If you let me part, be partners with you, I'll get the black guys involved and I'll get the Spanish guys involved. And that's exactly what happened. So I doubled his action. I went from him doing one card per game to three cards per game. Forget about Sundays. I would have them on every game. So I was split. We were splitting the profits. So I think we'd make like eight bucks per card each. So I was making like, you know, three cards a night, $24 plus. <laughs> yeah. I made a dollar forty an hour in the prison. I was living like a doctor, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was moving from town to town like Segura, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh shit, dude. <laughs> I was moving every t- I was moving every three weeks like Tom Segura. <laughs> <laughs> And then you're stashing this cash and steroids and all this that's come funneling into you. You're hiding it off property, out of camera. Just, so then, I'm, I'm, and then they come to you to get like sort of the general store almost to get their shit. Is that how it works? So they would come to me to get like uh, the hide stuff for them. So I knew what was really going on behind the scenes there. You know, I knew, you know, like John Clark, that dude. He would his girlfriend would come on Mondays and he would make out with her and she would pass a balloon on to him. Ah. And he would put it in his mouth. And that balloon was filled with speed, meth at the time. So we would go back to his barracks and we'd do a line of peace. And then we'd go to a, a ba- on Mondays, you were allowed to go to the basketball court in a high school close by and play basketball. Me and him would go in there on speed. And just go fucking off in there on Monday. I wouldn't sleep till Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Every week. And they're I not piss testing you guys? They would do surprise piss tests, but they couldn't catch certain things. Like, they weren't going to run a spectrum on you. They were going right. to test you for what, what drug you came back, you went to prison for. With me, it was nice. cocaine. So they would always test me for cocaine, you know. So I did... Even like the, the holidays didn't bother me in there. Like I thought I was going to have a real hard holiday in there. The holidays were fucking great in there. Number one. <laughs> oh, number one. I can't even believe what I'm hearing. Oh, it was one of the best Christmases I ever had in my life. We gave, <laughs> e- we gave, each, we gave each other presents and shit. Because there was this, we, we, were, we were allowed to go to the store every day. You had 20 minutes to walk to the store and come back. All right. This is exactly like um, I had a laundry camp that was at um, it was a laundry camp, a minimum security facility for guys just like you right in right by me where I lived. It was uh, on this mental institution property. It was part of their acreage. It was this back corner. And every now and then you'd hear a siren because one guy would get out of there or whatever. But I went and watched their softball team, the Dirty Sox. But we would see them every now and then. They'd be at the corner store because they'd be allowed off the property and they'd have to go back. So I'm, I'm. This is very much like what I grew up near. We'd see them over at the baseball field and shit, fucking around or whatever. So, this is interesting to me. This is what's, what's going on with these guys in there, huh? Let's take a quick break and tell you about our first sponsor, Raycon. Now, I've been listening lately to podcast i've been listening to ymh i'm listening to rogan i'm listening to two bears one cave i'm listening to josh potter's new podcast as a matter of fact all of my raycons and my spotify music uh and if you're using a pair of premium wireless earbuds especially if you can get them at less than half the price of the other guys 
I'm recommending the wireless earbuds from Raycon, okay? I've used them to travel, work out, everything. They stay in, they're good, the base is solid, the recharging case is fantastic. There's no weird cords and, uh, you know, knobs hanging off the end. Uh, and everybody's trying to borrow them from me. They take it. My stepson, I told you, he took the other pair I had. Uh, but their newest model, which is the one he took, the Everyday E25 earbuds are their best ones yet. They have six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, a more compact design, a noise-isolating fit. Uh, Raycon earbuds are stylish. They're discreet. Um, the company was co-founded by Ray J and celebrities like Snoop, Mike Tyson, Brandy, uh, and everyone is obsessed with their products right now. So give them a try. Raycon has a 45-day free return policy. That's awesome. For a limited time, you get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash honeydew. That's buy, B-U-Y, Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N.com slash honeydew for a special 15% discount on Raycon wireless earbuds. Make sure to check it out now while the deal's running. Buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Our next sponsor is Upstart. Now, during these economically turbulent times, everyone's looking for a way to feel more financially secure. So if you're still needlessly throwing money every month at high interest credit card debt, it's time you checked out Upstart, the revolutionary online lending platform that knows you're more than just a credit score. And now is the time to find out how low your Upstart rate can be to help pay off high interest credit card debt. Unlike other lenders, Upstart can reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter rate. You don't need a degree or a diploma to apply though. Upstart lets you skip going to the bank because it's completely online. They offer loans from $1,000 to $50,000 so you can consolidate your debt into one easy fixed rate payment. Upstart makes it fast and simple to check your rate and since it's just a soft pull, it does not affect your credit score. The hard pull happens if you accept the rate and proceed with your application. And the best part is if the loan is approved and accepted, most people are getting their funds the very next business day. Over 400,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards or meet their financial goals. Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt and get back to using your money your way with Upstart. See why Upstart has a 4.9 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash honeydew to find out how low your Upstart rate can be. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash honeydew. Our next sponsor is Manscaped. Now listen up, fellas. We have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker, which is a nose and ear hair trimmer. I want you to take a look in the mirror right now, and I guarantee you're going to see some hairs sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and your nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. I don't know how many of you ever had that, that hair sticking out and you wish you had something. I've used nose hair trimmers that suck. and Pop that thing out, and your eyes start watering, and you get that one weird, like, ear hair and you're like where the hell did that come from manscape is forever changing the grooming game with their weed whacker their nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology which helps prevent nicks snags and tugs in those delicate holes the premium manscape weed whacker uses a 9,000 rpm motor powered 360 degree rotary dual blade system it's intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it is waterproof which makes for easy operation and cleaning. The only nose hair trimmer on the market with a powerful and rechargeable lithium ion battery that lasts for up to 90 minutes of use. You ever tried to pull that nose hair out with your fingers? Yeah, that's going to hurt worse than nicking your balls, okay? Manscaped is making whacking your weeds a time to look forward to, delivering maximum confidence while providing hygiene. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Okay? It's time to upgrade your Manscaped routine with the Weed Whacker. Get 20% off plus free shipping with code HONEYDEW at manscaped.com. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and our hairs and our holes looking nice. That's, again, 20% off and free shipping with the code HONEYDEW at manscaped.com. One more time, y'all, 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code HONEYDEW. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weeds. Now, let's get back to the do. You had 20 minutes to go to the store and back, and it was a five-minute walk. So basically, you had 10 minutes to go into that store, buy ice cream, potato chips, milk, whatever you wanted. So I figured out something. There was a little Chinese joint next to the joint. 
I used to ask people, nobody ever gets Chinese food. How come? They're like, because you don't have enough time. No, you guys got to call it in. So I, was, I started calling in like little orders, like fried rice and like, you know, shrimp foo young, egg foo young or something. And I would get there, the food would be ready. I'd run into the bodega, get two things of Coca-Cola, and I'd run back. So I was eating Chinese food in jail. It wasn't the best Chinese food in the world, but at least it gave me a little yeah. bit of normality. Me and uh, Torrey Piles, <laughs> we loved the pork fried rice in that place. And he loved the chicken wings. So I would get him the fried chicken wings. So sometimes I would run over and get fried rice. And then Torrey would go over and buy like 300 fucking chicken wings. Like it was like six wings for three ninety five. He would get like 50 wings. The prison, <laughs> the prison didn't know what they we had in that bag. Right. It was great. There was no liquor store around there. So they really wouldn't look in your bag. And the, you could see the store from the guardhouse. So you could see if somebody met you for drugs. So they really didn't, they didn't really watch. I remember the first time I walked back with Chinese food, the guard was like, I've been here for fucking 10 years. Nobody has ever brought back Chinese food. How did you do it? And I go, I planned ahead. I called in for 10 minutes before I could get over there. So it actually sat for 10 minutes before I could get there. But there was, age was big then. AIDS, people didn't know how to handle AIDS. So they built they built a special barracks for the guys who had HIV. And they only had three or four guys who had HIV. I still, I could still see their faces. That's how much I hung out in the HIV unit. Because the HIV unit had a brand new TV, brand new refrigerators, brand new stoves. They could cook their own food in there. So we all figured out a way how to bring food in, cook for the HIV guys, and they would let us hang in their thing. They weren't, none of them, or they were all HIV because they were intravenous users, you know? I think one guy was a gay, but nobody ever gave him a hard time. He was just one of the guys, you know? And we'd, we'd watch, I remember Sunday nights going over there and watching Married with Children and Cops. That was our shit. Yeah. Cops on, you lived all week for cops on Sunday night. You lived for cops. But something interesting happened to me in there. And this is where everything changed for me. <clears throat> Since the minute I got in there, people would always ask me, hey, did you get your paperwork from the uh, those the first portion, I called it, of the first two weeks before you went to prison, before I went to the camp? I went to that place. Do you remember what I called it? The... Uh, the first yeah. two weeks, oh, whatever it was, I can't you, remember. Them. You're getting double time. You're getting double time out there. In no, 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 that's county. Oh, oh when, but in oh, between, when you got into, yeah, yeah. What did you call it? It's called something because when you go there, that's what they determine how many points you have. How many yeah, points? And I don't where, remember and, what you called it, but and where you're eligible to go to, you know, whether you have a driver's license, whether you had a job at the time of your arrest whether you had a high school diploma, all these things counted towards where you were going to go. If you had over three points, you would go to a minimum security prison. Do you know how many points I had? Minus oh, one and a half. <laughs> how? So, how did you lose points? <laughs> so I was eligible. I was eligible for a halfway oh, house. Shit right off the bat. I was eligible for a halfway house right off the bat. Remember, my sentence was 48 months, but there was a house bill, house bill 1200, 1204, 1200, that if you were a first time offender and your sentence, not what you were arrested for, what you got convicted of was nonviolence, you, your sentence would be cut in half. So what I did was one of the guys got out. He was the law house clerk. So for three or four weeks, I studied really hard. I got a book and I studied all the laws and I took a test. And guess what? I became a, a law time, 
So I was the stock clerk. I was the fucking, the guy who drove the sandwiches. And now I was also the attorney at the prison. So when somebody got a write-up, I would argue with the guards and get so there. You're like basically the, the, like the shop steward <clears throat> of the union for the prison. Right. So I became wow, that guy. Wow, you're a representative? All so right. I became that guy, and I fucking won every case. <laughs> Did you win them all? Oh, I won them all. <laughs> Dirty, clean, whether I got to them on the side and talked to them. You know, I would talk, I would talk to the guy who wrote the fucking report and nail him down a little bit and throw him off. And, you know, I, got, I had a good relationship with a lot of those guards. There were some guards that were just douchebags. But a lot of them, they were human beings. And I knew how to tap into that side. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. they were okay with me. But the guy, I never won over. I, 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 I won him over slowly. The guidance counselor I had, Mr. Blue. I was about to ask, the one that okay. didn't like anybody. Yeah. So I got there probably the beginning of September. But by November, I had softened them up. By November, I had softened up the whole place. I'm not going to look you in the eye and tell you I was running the place. But off the record, I kind of was. Because I was running the gambling. I knew where all the dealers were. I knew where they were hiding their stash. I didn't mess with their stash. I was always respectful. I charged them a nice amount. I was fair. I also told them what food to eat and what not to eat, which they really appreciated, you know. If I knew a guy was a bodybuilder, I got him extra milk and I give him the nice cuts of meat so he could cook them on his own. I learned how to, you know what I'm saying? I learned how to take care of people. So now people took care of me. You know, I did it on the Rogan podcast once. If the food, if they would serve you shit on shingles, what is that called? Did you ever hear that expression? It's corn. Yeah, shit on a shingle. Corn yeah, beef like hash or whatever. Yeah, that shit. No, not not corned beef hash. It's called uh, beef something. But what it's called in the army and all that stuff is shit on shit shingles. on the shingle. I, yeah, my dad taught me that from the military. Yeah, shit on shingles. So shit on shingles. Whenever they served that, I would sit behind the line of the food, and it would be like chicken hawk would be serving. Etchy, this is a tall, skinny brother, six foot three. He was like a junior at one of the colleges, wide receiver, Michael Irvin looking, all American. He went out to a bar. He went out to a bar and punched some guy, and the guy died in the hospital. That's why you gotta be that's why you gotta be careful with your hands. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. so you had Etchy, and then next to Etchy on the line was this other dude, and he was a bank robber. All right, he was a professional bank robber. And him and his brothers were all bank robbers. They were black. They were African-American. But he was funny because his job in the kitchen was part-time. He only worked the night shift. But the day shift, he would be there for lunch. And it would be a smaller crowd because the other half was out working, picking up papers. So he would always come up to me and go, Cuba, Cuba, let me holler at you for a minute. And I would go, what? <laughs> I go, what's up? They go, is Mr. Yarbrough gonna be in the in the in the kitchen at lunchtime? I go, sometimes he's in there, sometimes he's in the stock room, double checking my double checking my work. And he goes, listen here, brother. He goes, listen, I gotta work on my freezes. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, man, I'm going to be free in about 90 days. And I got to work on my freezes and shit because it's not my shit this week. He goes, one time my brother had the flu and he went to rob a bank. And he tried to yell freeze and his shit cracked so people didn't pay attention. You got to keep your free. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> He wants to go in there to ho- practice hollering freeze with command. So, <laughs> <Joey>. so, 
<laughs> his brother had to yell freeze a second time. <laughs> that is humiliating. He goes, the way he goes, the way you yell freeze is very important because it's gotta be a word, a certain word. It's gotta come out of your throat a certain way and people react to it. He goes, so I gotta practice my freezes and shit. So I said, All right, come into the kitchen. So sure enough, he'd wait to everybody went. <laughs> That is he'd, wait, ridiculous. he'd wait till everybody was online. They all had their plates in their hand. And he would jump down. And he would jump in the back door with an imaginary shotgun and go, <laughs> freeze, shotgun. motherfuckers. Yeah, like <laughs> Nah, that was that, that, that didn't really let me do this again. <laughs> He's coaching himself out. That is oh my ridiculous. god. And they would go, <laughs> Oh God. I don't want to tell you what the black guys would say, though. The black people offend them the most. The black people were so offended was. by the African-Americans would yell at them and say, what the hell's the matter with you, man? Get your shit together, brother. Come on, man. Grow up. And he'd be like, what? I got to keep my freeze game tight. He was dead well, serious. Freeze game. His freeze game had to be tight. You have no <laughs> idea how much I laughed in that. But <laughs> then, then on, thir- on either Wednesday, dude. then on either Wednesday or Thursday night was movie night, and they would play the worst movies in the world. Just to like piss what? Off. What are you getting? Like you know, fucking what's the movie? What's the greatest movie of all time? Like Stephen black and King. white. Like shit like that, like black and white yeah. stuff that African Americans and convicts don't want to see that shit. They want to see the Terminator. They want to see Rambo. Black people love Rambo. Do not ever <laughs> get confused. All right. Hate fire, <laughs> love Rambo. <laughs> Bro, they love Rambo. They, they only hate, listen, black people only hate fire if it's going to them. They love it, shot other people. They go crazy. <laughs> They love it. They love it. <laughs> oh, oh, so, God, <laughs> so for me going oh, off shit. in the kitchen, because I would go off on the kitchen. When they would come in and it was bad food, I would go, don't do it. That's all I would do for me. For minutes at a time, I would just go, don't do it. Don't do it. Mr. Yarbrough would look at me and goes, Jose Diaz, why do you keep saying don't do it for? They won't eat my food. I go, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't do it just for me thinking. It's a thing I use to stop being a criminal. So he's like, I know you're lying to me, boy. How come nobody's eating my beef? How come nobody's eating the chicken today? You know, like he would always attack me. If I would say don't do it or whatever. And I would always go off on it. Mr. Yarbrough, relax, man. What's the big problem? Look at that shit. Would you eat that? I don't see you eating it, Mr. Yarbrough. So all those kitchen guys saw that. So on Wednesday night or Thursday night was projector night. We would watch those stupid movies, PT 109 and shit like that. Like a bunch of black and white movies. And the projector would always break. So... One day, I just got up, and I'm like, I'm sick and tired of this thing. The state's got so much money. When are you going to get a new fucking projector? And all the guys were like, give it to him, Cuba. That's a boy. Give it to him. And that's how it started. And there was like a, an African-American dude that was one of those red dudes that had freckles. And we would goof on him. He was a great guy. He would let us we would call him freckles and shit. And they would all get up and, and say, you know, Cuba, get up there whenever the projector would break. That's what happened. The projector would break. The tape, the the, the film would break, and mm-hmm. people would people would go, Cuba, get up there. Get up there. Get up there and talk. Tell us about the week. And I would go, what do you think about fucking Etchy? Fucking giving you mashed potatoes with no butter. And he'd go, fuck you, motherfucker. And I'd go off. So it started like a weekly thing. They would say, go on, go up there and do 10 minutes. And I would go up and do com. I was I w- I didn't know I was doing comedy. So I wait, I, I, yeah, comedy. I want to. I want to. 
Is this the first time you'd ever really got up and performed in front of a crowd at all? It was in prison, sort there, of what there got was, you there? there? There wasn't a stage. There wasn't a microphone. Yeah. There wasn't nothing. But you're just up there talking to these guys. and Talking to these guys. Them. But you remember what I told you on the podcast about we the did on the church? No, oh, okay. but about the guy that I worked with at Subaru that didn't like me. Me and him had gotten into an argument. Yeah, and one yeah. day he came up to me and he goes, I don't know if you know what I did before I came to work here. He goes, I worked in Las Vegas in the entertainment business. And he goes, between you and me, I think you should get into stand-up comedy. His name was his name was Grant Fusemith. And I remember looking at him going, you know what? You're a fucking asshole. But I remember going home <laughs> and, and just thinking about that, that maybe I was a comic. So now, here I am eight months later, and I'm actually doing comedy in a weird sort of way, but it's not He's registering. balls. Yeah, it's not registering with mm -hmm. me. One day, the, the counselor, my counselor saw me doing that one night. There was one night a month he stayed there late, and this was this particular night. And it was probably like a November night. It was after Thanksgiving, going into Christmas. I remember like it was yesterday. Because I was walking out. And for weeks, I would bust his balls about the report from diagnostic. That's what it was. Diagnostic. diagnostic. Thank you. I was so focused on that you said, remember the guy that showed you the pictures of the girlfriend in the bikini, and I haven't wanted to forget that. This is this is horrible to think of, but you have to think about it from this perspective. I kept asking him, yo, tell me what's on my diagnostic report. Tell me what's on my diagnostic report. And he would look me in the face and go, you don't really want to hear what's on your diagnostic report because you couldn't handle it anyway. And I kept busting his balls, busting his balls, busting his balls. And one of those nights that I went off, I caught him. And I'm like, just off adrenaline, I got in his face a little bit. I go, when are you going to tell me what's on that report? And he goes, you really want to know? And I go, yeah, I really want to know. And he goes, come with me. And he went in his office and he fucking went in his desk and he pulled out a file and he threw it on the table. And he goes, you want me to fucking tell you what it says? He goes, I'll tell you what it says. And he started reading the psychological shit. And he goes, he took off his glasses and he goes, in other words, what this says to me is that you're a deadly individual. It says that if you want something that I have, you will do anything that it takes to get that thing. So a person should just give you whatever you want. So from now on, when you want something, just ask for it. Because if not, you're just going to take it from them anyway. And I remember looking at him going, thank you for telling me I'm just a piece of shit thief. I appreciate that. And he looked at me and he goes, I told you you weren't going to be able to handle it. I didn't talk to him for like three weeks after that. That blew all that fun I had, all that fun I was having came to an end because I realized now I was in prison and I realized I was a piece of shit that I was just going to end up a fucking thief. So I would see him and I wouldn't even go to his meetings anymore. I was getting out of there in February anyway. It didn't really matter. <clears throat> so one day I was walking in the daytime and he saw me and he goes, what happened? You lost your balls ever since I told you the truth? And I go, no, I just don't want to hear that shit. And I'm just a fucking thief. He goes, come here for a second. He goes, you obviously didn't understand what I was saying to you. And I go, what, what are you saying? I'm a thief. And he goes, no, I'm telling you that you're a deadly individual because whatever you want in this life, you can get it. 
He goes, you're running this Chuck and Jive, nickel and dime shit. He goes, you don't think I know about it? He goes, you're a fucking genius compared to these guys. He goes, I don't think you understand how dangerous you are. That if you want something, it's yours. You could just take it, you know? And that resonated with me. Like, just, just, it just destroyed me. Because he was right. He was right. You know, like he... And then I had a system. I didn't work an eight-hour day. I went in at eight. Of, co- of course you did. You know, you know me, dog. I worked like a two-hour day. <laughs> you know, two hours. I, I went in. I basically went in the morning, made sure the guys had their shit. If you know anything about me, I'm well prepared. They had their shit the night before. They're early. You're there early. And, yep. and then the truck would be filled already with the sandwiches. I would help him out. I would go through the gate. A guard would get in with me. We drive together. We talk shit. We drive. They take the sandwiches out. We go back to the fucking thing. It'd be nine o'clock by then. And then I would shoot straight to the library. And then the library was a white dude that looked like Josh Potter. And he was from <laughs> Buff- He was also from Buffalo. He was in there for double <laughs> murder. He murdered. Holy shit. He murdered his wife and the mailman, which made it a federal offense. They were fucking. <laughs> I should <laughs> laugh. So that's what made it. Is that true? It really did. I like. I like. Yeah. Oh, federal offense. Oh, <laughs> but. Oh god. He, he was like Josh Potter. And he was very intellectual. He was very smart. He wore glasses. He rolled his own cigarettes. And I I had maybe three weeks left. And one day I went in there and he gave me a black notebook. You know, the black and white notebooks, the regular ones, where you put your name, your grade, and your address. He gave me one of those with a pen. And he goes, that's... uh, a notebook for you so you can write your jokes. I go, I don't write jokes. He goes, well, wait a second. Whenever you go up there on Wednesday nights, that's just you talking? I go, yeah, I guess. I don't have time to write jokes. I've never written a joke in my life. He goes, so you don't sit down during the weekend? Well, you see me. I'm in here reading sports and arguing because I would go in there. It would be me, him, and Chicken Hawk. Chicken Hawk was in there for involuntary murder, and he was African-American, but he was well-spoken and intelligent as fuck. So we'd go in there and just talk about whatever was in the newspaper. It was like three convicts talking about the world's events and shit. And I learned a lot from those two guys. Those two guys were fucking a lot smarter than I was, you know. And he gave me the notebook, and he goes, listen, I'm going to be out of this hole in two years. If when I get out, you're not a stand-up comic, I'm going to hunt you down and kill you. I would take that as a serious threat. So, you know, I went back to the Mr. Blue and I apologized for my behavior. And a few on January 20th, 1989, my case went back up in front of the, uh, there was a president who got inaugurated that day. January 20th, 1989. I forget what, I think it was Bush. One of the Bushes, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it have to be, right? Yeah. Um, w. Yeah, I went up in front of the... Uh, no, 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 no. Senior, senior. What am I saying? Yeah, I went up in front of the board, and they gave me community corrections. And I think uh, by February 13th, I was in BCTC, the halfway house in Boulder. And that's a whole different story. That's how, that's what we pick up next time from <laughs> BCTC. That was my whole prison experience. So I had a really good time in prison. And I prepared myself to go in like I lifted weights, I swam, I rode a bike. I knew what things I was going to do and what I wasn't going to do. And the experience was completely different from what I thought it was going to be. 
Like when I came out of prison, it was completely different than what I thought I was going to be. I didn't see anybody get raped. And yes, there was one guy that didn't mess with me. He was a young guy that hung out in the biker crew. And whenever he was with his biker friends, he would make little comments at me. So I let my friends know what was going on. And they said, whatever it is, we got your back. So I had John Clark's crew, which they were uh, Nazis, like little neo-Nazis. That's the other thing. John Clark was pretty much a neo-Nazi. Like he had like a swatch. Yeah, to I figured back. that. Yeah, I figured. But if he, you're going to survive in prison for 20-some years, you got to yeah, go drastic. I mean, yeah, yeah. He, he loved me for who I was. We would talk about Cube all the time. In fact, that's how that's how we became tighter because the lady who raised him was Cuban. So his mother is his, his like his uh, babysitter was Cuban. So he told me how much food, how much he liked the Cuban food, and that's how we became friends. And I remember snorting speed with him and seeing the SWAT sticker. So I had his support, and I had the black guy's support. If I went to war with this biker. They told me exactly how to do it. They said, just get them one-on-one. Don't involve the bikers. And one day we were listening to Guns N' Roses had just come out. Remember, I got sentenced as Sweet Child of Mine had taken over the world. So now it's yeah. November of 88. And, uh, November of 88. November rain. And, and, <clears throat> and, and Guns N' Roses is everywhere. That first album is huge. And I remember getting into an argument with one of the bikers about Mr. Brownstone. That it was about heroin. He goes, it's not about heroin. And I go, it's about heroin. And that's when that kid started to argue with me. What do you know? You hang out with blacks and all that. And I'm like, oh, you dumb motherfucker. So the first thing I did to him was he would torture me a little bit. I knew I could fuck him up. But in his quick, I, I, would, I would get killed. If I ever got caught in his area of the yard, I would get killed because there were like two guys that in that crew that I didn't really like. The leader, obviously, I told you I couldn't remember what his dog, some raw dog or something like that was his name. He was a disgusting guy. And him, I didn't like the long haired guy. So I knew if I I knew I had to take him out eventually at some point. But I also knew that I had a secret weapon that he didn't have, which is the mind of Joey Diaz. I'm going to fucking break you down mentally, motherfucker. So he had a job in the kitchen. So I didn't torture him in the kitchen. I left the kitchen alone because I could just fuck him up in the kitchen. It would be easy with the blacks around me and nothing would happen. The black dudes would help me. What I did was I took a, a American cheese box You know the cheese the government sends you? I took the box, I took the cheese out, and I took a shit in that box. I took the biggest shit you ever seen in your life. It had to be like a 19-inch shit that broke together. I took paper towels, and I put it in the box. And then I I took a little, they had like little American flags in the workshop. I took a little work, and I put it in the piece of shit, and I I covered the box, and I put it in this drawer. And I put his clothes over it. And every day he would stop us on the way and go, oh. does anybody else smell shit? And we would go, no, nah, I don't smell nothing. And he goes, I swear to God, I smell shit somewhere. <laughs> this, one, this went on for like a month. I was just taking American shit boxes, taking shit to him. <laughs> and then I would put him in the ceiling. He had ceiling tile that you could pick up. Uh-huh. Every other ceiling tile had a box with a piece of shit in it. Oh. And, ev- and eventually one day he, he found the one in the drawer and it had gone from 19 inches to about six and a half. All the moisture had gotten <laughs> out of it. It was just down to peanuts and a couple clusters of, of hair and whatever the fuck, a couple of corn clusters and shit. Dog, he flew out of there. He's like, he's like somebody's, somebody's messing with me. I'm going to find out who it is and fuck him up and all this stuff. But there was a gym area. And the gym area was a room that was next to the laundry room. 
and they had a billboard up in that room about jobs or events or situations or programs you could get into or whatever. And one Saturday, I'm working in the kitchen, and I see him by himself walking into that area to drop off his laundry. I go, this is when I get this motherfucker today. I thought, I remember it was cold out, so it had to be like January, February, December. But the sun was out. It was a really pretty day, but it was cold. So I waited for him to go back and get his clothes. And I told the black guys, the only people who would hang out in the gym were the black dudes that would play dominoes. So there was a bunch of guys playing bones, and they would listen to Bobby Brown's Don't Be Cruel. Don't be don't be, I will be, right? So they would fucking, when Bobby Brown would go up, the room would light up and they would throw the fucking bones. It was great. But in the daytime, they didn't play. It was just a couple of brothers that would lift weights. So I waited till the guy went in and I went to the side door and brother, I caught him as he was taking the clothes from the dryer, from the uh, washer and putting it in the dryer. I just stood behind him. And the wall next to us had the billboard on it with all the events that are going to happen. He fucking turned around and I was right there on him. I go, you still got that problem with me? And before he could even say anything, I grabbed my hand in between his hair. And that's why I've never liked long hair. And I grabbed his hair. I locked him in like a... I didn't know anything about Muay Thai. It was really... It was really like holding somebody doing Muay Thai, holding their neck and kneeing them. I didn't even know that stuff. I just did it with his hair. I grabbed his hair and I dragged him over and I banged his head off that billboard possibly 20 times. Like that was the, <laughs> that was, that was the only bad thing I did in there. I banged this fucking head like 20 fucking times. I mean, boom, 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 boom. He went down. He woke up. He never said nothing again. And he was three doors down from me. We were in the same bunk because we both worked in the kitchen. He never said a fucking word. He knew I told him when I was banging his head. I go, the next time me and John Clark will fucking kill you. So don't ever speak up around me again because he would always throw little remarks and shit. After that, when he would see me, he wouldn't say two fucking words. I still remember this kid, what he looked like. He was a white kid with long hair and big retarded lips. He just he just wasn't even normal. That fucking poor retard wasn't even normal. They were probably giving him fucking transgender pills or something at the time, the poor bastard. But that's it. <laughs> Uh, wait hold on that's not it because i have two quick questions you said about the dude showing you the bikini pictures of his girlfriend you said hold on to that and remember that for later why what do, what do you, does that come back okay so i get to the halfway house i'm uh i'm working at boulder toyota no i'm working as a detailer and I get out of the halfway house, my child is born. And I hear Boulder, the city of Boulder is on alert because a guy escaped from prison in Canyon City and he was headed to Boulder to get his girlfriend. It was that idiot. Damn. From Summit County that had broken that had broken out. So what he basically did was he broke out of jail because she let him know that she was sleeping with his roommate. Yeah, who didn't see that coming? He got so crazy. I guess he did. He broke out of a medium security prison. Like, I, I won't tell you the story how he did it because I don't remember and I would just be lying anyway. All I do know is He broke out of that medium security prison, stole a car, and went to Boulder. He went to, uh, I think it was somewhere off of Lee Hill Road. And he said he saw four kids target practicing, shooting guns. 
So he went up to them with a fake wallet. And he goes, I'm a wildlife guy. Put your pistols down. I want to see identifications. The kids put their weapons down. He picked up the weapons and shot the four kids and took their guns and went, in, shit. and went into Boulder. He went into Kmart, which I lived across the street from at the time. And he bought ammunition. They had proof of them. So they locked the city of Boulder down. They knew they had a wild guy. I went home when it was on TV. I couldn't even tell my wife or anybody. I was in jail with him. Like, I, I, I was in county fucking oh. jail with this idiot. So I lived on 30th, close to baseline. I lived on 28th Street. If you went to, like, 32nd Street in Boulder on your way to Longmont, there used to be a jazz club there, like a blues club. I don't know what the name of it was. It was 30 fucking years ago. This story I'm telling you happened in 1990 or not, even 91. But let's say, let's leave it at 1990. So this idiot broke out, shot the four kids, set up a meeting with his girlfriend to meet her at that blues club and got into a shootout with the cops. Jeez. One, of the, one of the cops shot him in the neck. There was a problem. The guy lived, but he needed surgery. Guess what the problem was? The only surgeon available was the father of one of the kids he shot. No. Fuck. Did those kids die, by the way? All those kids die? Yeah, we, we can look oh, it up. Jesus. We can look it yeah. up. Yeah. I, th I think two so of them what died. Happens? Two of them God. survived. I think he refused to take care of the dude. And the dude died or something weird happened. They had to go to court. Something right now it doesn't. I talked about it on a podcast once how weird of a story that was. That he, the guy refused to operate on the guy because he killed his son that afternoon. So that's the world I saw, man. It's a fucking crazy okay. world. First of all, thank you. You know I love thank you and I you. miss you. And thank you for making time for this because I know as a parent oh, right I know what's going on in this world. I know. No, it's important. Um, but I want to uh, just wrap up so when I listen again, I know. So th what are we, February? <clears throat> excuse me, February sure. 88 we're going to pick up. March 88 we're going to pick up. You're out of prison. No, we're going to pick up February of 89 when I get into 89. the halfway house, BCTC. So you're going from prison into this halfway house. Which, so now we're in the halfway house for the first time. And this is the fun right, part. We're going to pick up this is when I put, <laughs> This is when I put bleach <laughs> pellets on my dick to pass the piss <laughs> test. And this is all fun. All right. February so, yeah. uh, 89. <clears throat> so by now, so listen, Joey's joint should have like two experimental podcasts out by now. We're just going to rough it the first couple of weeks until all the parts come together for our studio, and then we'll move into the studio. But for now, I'm just going to start a podcast right here with what you're seeing with this face, and we're just going to do our thing until the wheels fall That's off. Awesome. Well, I love you, brother, and uh, thank you I so love you much. Too. And, uh, thank you to all your you hit people. Me up. You got it. We'll do this once a month. You know Whatever me, dog. Want, I don't fuck around. Patreon.com slash Joey Diaz. Stay black, you bad motherfuckers. Don't forget Uncle Vinny's I Wednesday nights in October. 36 people, so you got to buy your tickets fast. All right, That's all I you. got. Say hello to everybody, Ryan I, Sickler. You know I love I will, you, cocksucker. I Stay love black. you, too. As always, Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. We'll talk to y'all next week.